Is this lecture 10? Uh, I don't even remember if I gave you the notes for lecture 9. Yeah. Did I give you the you notes? Did. Yeah. But I mean... Topics? Yeah. I don't think so. I didn't think so. <laughs> I promise in the next <laughs> I realized thinking over this. Oh, Nicholas. <laughs> nope. Topics for... Well, that's the picture. Okay. All right, so I always some topics. Okay. Let's go over questions about the test. Um, I realized that problem number five that had to do with lifetime of a system was not assigned to the undergraduates. So I want to make sure that any questions about that problem. Uh, number four was not assigned to the undergraduates. Ah. Problem 66 was from the tag. So I just want to make sure that uh, everybody has that um, idea, the ideas of that problem. Or maybe we're going to have a vote as to whether we should have that problem on the people doing on that problem from five from the thing on review. The graduate students presumably are okay on that. I think you went over just a similar problem last week. Yeah, I did go over one. It was kind of a long-winded one. But I guess um, no questions? Okay. Oh yeah. yeah. You asked for two methods okay, I for uh, <laughs> Problem two. Okay. One yeah. method I thought just the rejection method. Okay. The rejection method yeah. is the key method. And then I said for extra credit, give me another one. I, thought I want you to know the rejection I'm, method. I know the, the other one, like, you can one use one. the transformation to do it. One down down. Because I did it last semester, but, well, a couple of semesters. But. I'm right. I talked about quantile transform for generator and her levels in chapter two. Quantile transform. That was what? Durham C. F inverse of U. Yeah. yeah. The one that says that it maps yeah. the uh, C F maps to a uniform function. Yeah. Okay. Well, yeah, but it's actually proposition D that like gets applied. Proposition D on the same page. The quantile transform. That's close. Yes. <laughs> on page 63. Proposition D, let U be uniform, let X equal the CDF, the inverse function of the CDF applied to U. At is a quantile transform, so called quantile transform. That gives you a random variable. So if you calculate the seed, so that's another method. Um, very useful. Now, for a question like that where you say for extra credit, it might not be easier to find the inverse function. So for a general density, but in this case, I think it wasn't that difficult. Yes, go ahead. Do you, I mean, would it be acceptable just to say, uh, inverse transform of this and rejection method, or do you want to actually see it applied where we actually well, do I need the inverse? Well, you know how to actually calculate the inverse function. Okay, I need to see what you're actually doing. I need okay. to see what the quantile transform right. is. In that particular example, where the density was very simple, the quantile transform would actually be not that difficult oh, yeah. to apply. However, that's why the rejection method is, is given, because you can't always easily compute this quantile. Why not? Well, I think it's just you find the inverse function of the inverted relationship. How do you find the inverse function of that? So it might not be so easy. There can be an increasing function trying to algebraically solve some kind of increasing function. Um, oh, let's just take the standard normal case and make control. Okay? The standard normal case gets to you have to use the table in the back of the book to find the inverse function of the smooth distribution function of the standard normal. So you'd be, you'd be you don't have a formula, you have to reduce it to some table. It's already been computed. Um, so if I tried to, to generate a normal, what would be proposition D, page 63? Page 63, use proposition D, page 63, to generate a standard normal variable. <laughs> from the first course. Anyway, so then you have capital V of x equals integral minus infinity of x e to the minus z squared over 2 over squared into pi. dz is the cumulative distribution function, cdf, 
of M01. This is the standard um, notation for a capital P. Right? And that's calculated in the back of the book. Right? And then I would have to say that my, my random variable is Z, or X equals X now equals phi inverse of capital U. All right? But I have no way of calculating phi inverse algebraically. So I put my U value would be the probability in this table. It would be the body. So I would plug a number like 0.75 into the into the body of the table and have to look to the side column x. That would be my random variable. So for example, if I put in u equals 0.75 from appendix uh, seven, <coughs> appendix 7, a7. If I put in u equal to 0.75, I'd have to look for that in the body of the table and do a little interpolation or something, I'd get about 0.675. Okay? So then I'd get, uh, for example, u equals 0.75 gives x equals 0.6. No. I'm looking for the, um, u is the probability now. Phi inverse, you're, the phi is math, the phi function gives you, you put in a number on the side and you get the number in the table. The inverse, you take it and put a number from the table and get it on the side. Oh, okay. You get two. Whoa. Okay, so if I put u equal, u equals uh, 2.05, I'm getting that 2.05, I can't get u equal 2.05. How about 0.9? Okay, this gives x equals, now I look for okay, 0.97. So, yeah, so about 1.88. Okay, gives x equals 1.88. And what if I had u equals 0.25? What would I get? It would be 0.67. Uh, minus 0.675. The whole t the whole inverse function is not given in this table, right? I mean, the whole function is not given in this table. Only half of it got a symmetry. Okay, so that's how you would generate normal numbers using the table. Try to put it in the computer. You have to have capital P inverse, all right? Record it, record it as you know, tabulated in the computer. So it has to be stored as, as a resident function. Okay, because you can't calculate. Oh, you can't. Why would you? No. You can't calculate the partial integral, much less the inverse relationship. All right. <coughs> so, this is something you can't do that, but practically. Okay? So, but the rejection method is straightforward. Okay? And when you say describe here, do you just want, like, the algorithm you would use in order to read? Yeah, I want you to very precise yeah. exactly the algorithm. You, know, you can write a program if you want. <coughs> I'd rather have it say it stated in words, okay? But if, you, if, if you're really better just writing a program, you can write it. Syntax error I would not have it. Unfortunately, if it's in C, I will, I will flounder, so that's not right. Uh, then you have me all messed up. So I just want it in words. So no rejection method, please. Okay. So. Do problem number two. Was it number two? Okay. Um, so for like this, all you have to just, all we have to just say is f of x or e, x equals inverse of u or something. X equals f inverse u. I had to calculate f inverse u. See if I can get a copy of the test and get conversion out here so we can have a look at the test. That old version. I handed out the new versions, didn't I? Yeah.
handed out, did I not hand out revised versions of the test? Oh, okay. Problem two, how could random variables with the density function 1 plus x over 2 minus 1 less than x less than 1 and f of x equals 0 otherwise be generated from uniform distributed numbers from the interval? Look at the rejection method there. And of course, I will specify on the new version of the test. It's not going to be identical to this. Okay? So read, please read carefully. Describe more than one method for extra credit. So one, one method is to go ahead and compute it. This is the rejection method. So describe the rejection method. So two A rejection method. Describe. Well, now in the rejection method, there's a certain um, acceptance statement, right? Either you reject or you accept a value of the variable. And one of the problems on the homework was to calculate the probability of acceptance. How do you do that? One divided by the area. Okay, well, here's a picture. You've got some density on some region. I guess this was the region here in this case. Actually, it was height one, width two. One minus one was height one with this. This is the region in which, which a box that contains the density, right? Here's the density, f of x, in this case. Okay, and here's a box, the smallest box that contains the density. What you do is you pick numbers at random from the box. Uniform distribution in two dimensions, right? Because you take a uniform variable from minus one to one, you take a uniform variable from zero to one. Okay, and you pair them. That gives you uniform distribution on the rectangle. Everybody clear with that? The constant density on the rectangle. So, and then you, the dots that fall up, you accept the corresponding x value, okay? So you project the dot onto the x-axis, and then you accept that x value, all right? Everybody clear with that? So, um, if the dot is below the function you accept, if it's above the yeah. function you accept. So what percentage of the dots half. get accepted? Looks like well, half. for this, it looks like half. Well, oh, yeah, exactly half. Okay, area of the area of the function divided by area of the rectangle would be integral. Uh, even if it was even if this wasn't a density function, I was talking about this. In fact, the problem that you had in your text wasn't a density function. Yeah. Six x squared one minus x to quantity squared was not a density. All right, but it didn't matter because you to find the probability of acceptance, you just took the area under the curve divided by the area of the rectangle. You tried to tell us. I thought the area was one. Okay. <laughs> So the integral minus infinity to minus one to one at x dx divided by the area of the rectangle, probability of acceptance.
this is correct. So it would just be, uh, assuming that this is a density, it would be one over there at the right angle. Okay? If you take the smallest possible rectangle, okay? Uh, that's what you would get. Um, if you took a larger rectangle, it's still the same. It's still the same. Yeah. So this would give you one over the area of the rectangle. Assuming that F really is a density. It wasn't in your problem, though, from 37. No, F is not a density. No, F equals 6 x squared, 1 minus x squared, minus 1 less than x less than 1. Oh, it's it's not a density. So if it's not a density, are you going to state that? In problem. On the test. Um, yeah, I'm going to give you a density. In problem um, 3.37. Well, he should have said it. He should have had a density. <laughs> okay. The set right. is a density. If you have the density function there. So you have to get the, the, the right. So actually, it's just one over the area rectangle. So as long as you pick a valid rectangle, okay, <laughs> this is kind of easy. Right? It's just any rectangle that contains the density inside. Okay? So of course, to get the most efficient out of it, you want to take the shortest possible rectangle. Questions about this? All right, that's pretty easy, and that's cleared up hopefully. Okay. Problem one. What about problem one? Let's go back to problem one. Suppose you're given the radius of a circle is next dimension random variable parameter lambda. Derive the cumulative distribution function and the probability density function of the area. We did a lot of transforming the random variable. I had a equals pi r squared, and I have f sub r of little r is equal to lambda e to the minus lambda r, r squared zero. Okay, that's the density, and this is the relationship. What is the density of capital A? There's a couple ways of doing it. I think the easiest one is the distribution function method, because I'm asking for the distribution function anyway. So find F sub capital A of little a. This is the probability that capital A is less than equal to little a. This is the CDF of capital A. The nice thing is that since the random variable is always capital, you can always use the lowercase for the running variable, right? But to calculate this, I'm going to fix little a. And just regard this as an event. Capital A up to a little a, well, that just, if area is small, then of course the radius has to be small. To it, you know, this, that's, so this is equal to the probability that uh, pi r squared plus or equal to a little a, or probability that we're inverting this, that capital R less than equal to the square root of a by pi. Right? So r has to be small. The radius has to be small. And then I know, but now I can integrate this density up, all right? Find this. Um, so this is integral 0 to the square root of a by pi of lambda e to the minus lambda r dr. That's the distribution function method. Uh, basically, what that is is the distribution function of capital R evaluated the square root of a by pi. What is the distribution function of capital R? Uh, some people were working that out many times. Many people have memorized this, but have not memorized what the distribution function is. It's greater than zero. It's, it goes from when R is zero goes from so this value is one minus one to zero. When R is little r is infinity, it's one minus zero, which is one. That's right. The function is increasing from zero to one. So that's one way to memorize this. Is to know that it's got to check at the two endpoints. R equal to zero and R equal to zero. Integrate it. Okay, just integrate it. I don't want to have to integrate it again here, you know, just integrate it. But 
So this is just, okay, okay. I'll just put this in parentheses. You probably wouldn't want to do it that way. You did do want to do it this way, though. Now plug in, all you have to do is plug the square root of a by pi into that formula. That's all there is to the distribution function method. You just plug, so I get all this blah, 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 but at the end of the day, I inverted this relationship and plugged in r equals square root of a by pi into there. <laughs> okay? So that's just 1 minus e to the minus lambda to the square root of a by pi. That's the distribution function of capital A, a greater than 0. So that's easy. Now, how do I find the density? Find the derivative of that. Okay. I'm using the fact that the distribution, okay. This was, uh, I'm using the fact that capital A was an increasing function. Otherwise, I can't use this method. I've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, you know, what if I invert this relationship and I get two solutions or something like that? Then what do I do? So this has got to be increasing. Increasing, you've got to reverse the inequalities and stuff, but if there's an increasing function of capital R, then all is well, you just inverse the direction of the plug in. Okay? So, but in general, you would, you would start here. So it is, it is, for the general case, it's nice to know actually how you proceed. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> to know these lines. All right? Here, we're given a more general problem. And that's the method. All right? This is the method here. Okay. Okay. So little f sub a of capital A therefore equals d by d a of one minus e to the minus lambda squared a by i. Okay. And the calculus I think you okay. You have to differentiate that. Okay. You can't differentiate it. Write it as d by dA. One minus e to the minus lambda. I'll put the, all the constants together, square root of pi in here, and then I'll put a to the one half here. Oh. Okay. So if there's a constant a to the one half, then you use a chain rule to differentiate it. You get the, you get the minus sign, the constant. Sign. These two minus signs can't. Why do you have an extra five? Then I use the C, uh, PDF method. Okay, well, let's say you get the same thing with the PDF method. Okay, let's try the PDF method. The PDF method also requires a one-to-one uh, -a -one function. Otherwise, you have to mess around a little bit. Okay. Assuming we do have a one-to-one -one function, we do have a equals pi r squared. One-to-one -one is r squared is zero. All right. So then the PDF method is f sub a of little a dA equals f sub r of little r d r. Okay. A and R. Okay, so that means that F sub capital A of little a is F sub capital R of little r, where r means the inverse expression, the square root of a by pi. This means r of a. Okay, times uh, dr dA. Okay. And I can write 
ADR to gate is one over the ADR too. It's a number of ways. But I basically have, I have to be able to invert. So this is lambda e to the minus lambda, I guess, squared a by pi for the R of A. <laughs> dr dA, what's that? <clears throat> well, differentiate um, times d by dA then if you want to just go ahead and invert it and square a by pi again. Okay? What? dr dA. R is the square root of a by pi. Is the inverse relationship. Oh. I think you just. It's hard to figure out, right? It's not very hard to figure out. It's just a to the one half again. This is so. This is a to the one half divided by the square root of pi. I just pull out the square root of pi as a separate term. So I get lambda a pull over the square root of pi over here. U to the minus lambda. Uh, the same thing as I had before. A to the one half. I can write that as four and a half. Okay. Then I have a to the one root of a to the one half. Just one half. U to the minus. I'm not going to differentiate this expression. Oh, okay. That's just sitting there. I want to differentiate this. Okay, it's just a messy one because of all that square root of pi in there. This stuff all comes from the derivative. Okay? Okay? All right. Let's see, that's number one and two. What about three? I give you a joint density, find the marginal densities. This is a straight up out of three, prob probably 381. This is a 381 question. Emphasis on it. We took 381 because we might not have done the professor or instructor may not have emphasized multiple integration. Here you have to be able to do multiple integration. So I'll just check to see whether you know what you're doing. I'll just rip from it. So let's just go through that one. Joint density, find the constant, see that it is a joint density. <laughs> well, okay. Um, but I just let this function be this, and then find the constant C such that f is a, as a joint probability density of a pair of random variables x and y. Okay? The wording is a little funny here. I may change that slightly. But, uh, okay? I didn't like it the way I did it the first time. There it is. What should C be to make this a joint density? Okay. 
if I was going to sample from this joint density. Okay. So that's the support. I'll only find get dots in here, but it won't be it won't be uniformly distributed dots in that. Okay. Unless the density is itself constant. Okay. So the density is not constant, it's C times X. So do you do a double integral and um, let it equal to one and solve for yes. C. C? Yes. Yes. So, 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 the, so the volume, the volume under the surface has to be one. So the integral minus infinity to infinity minus infinity to infinity in the general case, fx y dy dx must equal one by definition. Okay? Require this. So this becomes integral x goes from 0 to 1, y goes from 0 to x, um, cx dy dx is to 1. Okay, which gives the integral 0 to 1, cx squared dx equals to 1, which gives c equals to 3. So you get the constant. And I think the part B is uh, find the marginal density of the x and y. If you got the constant wrong, well, then you get part B wrong, but I'm not going to count it against you. Okay? So they're, they're independent parts. So part B, what are the marginal densities of x and y? So what's, I don't know which one's the easiest. I guess let's just try the first one first, f sub x of x. That means I integrate out the y. So that means, let's see, that means I'm going to fix x. And it means I'm going to fix x somewhere along this x-axis, and I'm going to integrate y. So that means I'm going to integrate for a vertical line, roughly. Is that from 0 to x? Yeah, so then I have to, y goes from 0. This is y equals the 0 line. This is the y equals x. Curve, so that means y goes from 0 to x. Uh, then my cx to dy. Okay. C was calculated earlier, but um, I'll just throw it in at the end. So this becomes, again, the, uh, what does it become? That was only a single integral, so that becomes cx squared. Now, I do want you to put the interval which this is valid for, 0 less than x less than 1. Okay? Don't just give me a function cx squared, because that's not a density on the whole line, obviously. <laughs> okay. Okay. So I need, a, I need 0 less than x less than 1. And, with, and 3x squared is a density, 0 less than x less than 1. So actually, it wouldn't be figure out, hard to figure out c from this, even, just by inspection. Well, c better be 3 in order to make that a density. So that's one part, and then of course f sub y equals y. The interval minus b equals infinity f x y d x. Now I fix y and integrate across the figure as x goes from something to something, right? Now fix y. See, x will go from y to 1. Right? Left boundary to right boundary. Cx dx is my Okay. Now the integration is not trivial. C halves x squared from y to 1 equals c over 2 times 1 minus. Y is also between 0 and 1. Because remember, I project this 
whole figure onto the y-axis to figure out what the range of y values is. If I just look at one variable, then I, I'm looking at the y-coordinate of these dots, and I can run between 0 and the high point of this triangle. Everybody following that? that? That basic idea? I drop all this sand up to the y axis. Okay? Is that a density? Just might want to check it. If I integrate that from 0 to 1, I get 3 halves minus a half. That's an integration. It gives me 1. So it looks good. All right? Then are they independent random variables? two functions, what's function of x alone, what's function of y alone, I get a function, what would I get? I get uh, 3x squared times 3 half 1 minus y squared well, the other one on the unit square. And so in the actually the support of the joint density of the product, those two densities would be the unit square. Well, the support of this density is a triangle. You can actually see it right away, all right? Because in order for there to be independence, this picture, the support would, you know, the support would have to be the full rectangle. Okay. So the fact that it isn't automatically gives you that they're not independent. You following that argument? Yeah. Okay. That's kind of a nice result. The use of the support. This is called the support. So this region here is the support. Legible over there, Nicholas? Roughly. Okay, everybody's here anyway, so <laughs> matter. So in particular, since the support, well, those two functions are not the same, they're not the same function. Okay. Now we go to the next problem. It's given that the random variable x taking values in the unit interval has the probability density f of x equals 2x. 0 less than x It is also given that conditional on x equal to x, y is chosen uniformly from interval 0 to x. Find the joint density of x and y. Determine the unconditional density of y. Any comments or questions about that? What do I do? <laughs> what is this? What is the basic idea here? What's, what? This is a part of the chapter that sold everybody out, chapter 3, where I give you a marginal density, a conditional density, and ask you for the other, for the other marginal. And then actually, and then in the text in the Bayesian inference section, they actually ask you for the other conditional density, but that's trivial once you've gone this far, okay? Because then you just divide the joint density by the new marginal that you found. 
So you're given Is it all making sense now? A piece of cake? The first two chapters should have been a lot easier, right? <laughs> okay. So problem four, I'm just seeing if I'm hoping that's the result. Uh, I'm giving you the f sub x of little x is equal to two x, zero less than the x less than one. And then giving you, and then what? Then you have to figure out what the conditional density of y is. There's something about a conditional here. What is the conditional density of y? Joint divided by marginal. Joint divided by marginal. Yeah, but the information, but you're not given the joint. You're given the conditional density of y directly. What does it say? I didn't run out of formula for it, did I? Unfortunately, I gave it the fancy way. I said, why? I said, the why? Here's a way, here's another way of writing it. I don't, why given x equal to x is uniform on zero to x. That's what I said. There's a couple ways of doing it. Okay? This is, this is the conditional distribution of y. This is one way to write it. Given that x equals to x, how is y distributed? Okay? It's a conditional CDF. Conditional. Everybody following what I'm saying? This is, the, this is another way of writing the information that I gave on. Who knows how to solve it then? What's the conditional density of, of y? Y is uniformly distributed, but not on 0, 1, not on 0, 1 half, and 0 to x. So what's the density of a function which is uniform, of a random variable which is uniformly distributed on the interval 0 to x? Density is constant, right? A uniform density is constant. What's the constant? Okay? It's one of the length of the interval. If I have y uniform on AB as density, e minus a. No. f sub y of y equals 1 over b minus a or y between a and b and zero else. Okay? That's the density of a uniform. It's easy thing to memorize it. We'll have to memorize <laughs> Okay? If you, you can get some one of these things. Yeah, so the density is therefore 1 over x. Is that a constant? Yes, because x is fixed here. So I'm thinking it's all a matter of how old are you thinking? X is fixed. X is frozen. I'm freezing x and telling you what the distribution of y is. Okay? And that's for y between 0 and x. And 0 else. So this is a function of two variables if you think about it. Okay, it's all messed up, but I'm thinking of freezing x. Okay, and then it was a function of one variable, y. That's how you work with this conditional business. Okay. Now I can multiply these two together and I get the joint density. And this, this was zero else, right? So if I take this thing and I multiply it times this, what do I get? This is a function of one variable. This is a function of two variables. I get a function of two variables when I multiply. Okay. So this is a function of two variables. If you want to think about it, um, because y can be anything, right? Like infinity less than y less than infinity. Okay. No condition on y. I multiply these two, get two together, and I get the joint density f of x, y equals, well, it's 2x. I multiply the, the numbers, 2x times 1 over x, whenever I can multiply them. I can multiply them as long as x between 0 and 1, and y is less than x. OK? 
okay? That zero less than y less than x less than one, okay? Or less than or equal to one, like these inequalities if you like. I don't really care what you put strict less than or less than or equal to, it will not bother me one way or the other. You can even mix some less than some less than or equal to, I don't care. Alright? It won't make any difference. Then zero outs. So what do we actually get out of this? This looks like that, but x is canceled. I'm actually getting a constant density so over that good old triangle again. I gave you the triangle twice. <laughs> the triangle. Now, look what I have. I have the same triangle as what I had in the previous problem. Okay. Okay, here it is. Okay, but now I have the constant density, and the constant is correct, two. Right, because the area here is one half. Alright. So I actually have the joint, the pair is uniformly distributed on the triangle. The pair, x, y, is uniformly distributed on the triangle. Now I'm asking this for the uh, the um, marginal density of y. So I'm actually almost asking the same problem over again, three and four. Okay. Almost. All I have to do is plug this stuff in to get the joint density. Okay. And then I'm just asking for the marginal density of one. I'm not asking for anything tough there, really. So unconditional density is the same as marginal density? It just means unconditional. It means unconditional. So it would in this case. It means the marginal density. Marginal just means density. What's the density of y? I put in parentheses. You put in from this context, or you could put in parentheses marginal. Okay, because it's really what you're doing. Is you're it's because I don't want any, I, I don't want a conditional density of y because that I would have asked in the previous part. This is the conditional density of y. Okay, I don't want that answer. I just want the density of y. So I emphasize unconditional. So you don't give me this answer. Alright. But it is a marginal density also. Marginal just means the density of it. It's just, it's just the word marginal is put in there to emphasize how you're going to get it. Here the word unconditional was put in to emphasize I don't want a conditional density. Okay. It's almost the same problem, three and four. Maybe it didn't feel the same. Okay. <laughs> Comments about this? I probably won't give you the same region twice. <laughs> All right. Now that's not a picture of the plane, that's a picture of the density. Right? So just be careful. This one's the x-axis here, and this is the y-axis. So this one's a picture of the port of the joint density. That's the picture of the density of the y. Alright, so yeah. So when we integrate this, the integral has to be 
Very good. All right, so she's got her checking method going. All right. The system shown consists of components with independent explanation distributed lifetime issues parameter lambda to find the probability density of the system lifetime. Very, very far from the topics of this test, but I'm going to rephrase the problems a little bit, make it a little bit more precise, exactly what they want, you know, just that kind of a thing. It's going to be the same problems, problems okay? But, I, but I, you know, I'm just going to rephrase it a little bit, try to make it a little bit more precise, a little bit more specific here and there, where we change some numbers, change some regions. Do some different things a little bit. So you just have to read it a little bit carefully, but I don't think it's going to be a major stress. Right? Probably not going to change that much. Maybe some different things. You know, you'll, you know it may be a couple of twists and turns. I mean, you might have a curveball instead of a fastball. Okay. Except you're in the toes a little bit. Okay. So you know the material. Uh, system shows. Shown. Okay, this is the system I sh showed on the on the website. Like this. So each of the components has exponentially distributed lifetimes. You do parameter to lambda. What's the density of the system lifetime? So some people would name these things: component one, component two, component three. Maybe that's a different thing. The lifetimes could also be called C1, C2, and C3. So CI equals lifetime. Oh, I think so you call it TI. Oh, well, I'll just do it this way. I'll call the component I. Okay? And so the life system lifetime is what? That is equal to. You have to take the, the, the minimum of the maximum of these two lines, right? And within this line, the minimum. So it's the max of the minimum of C1, C2, and C3. Okay, so I mean, it's not hard to figure out if I put in some numbers, right? If I put in numbers of 16, 12, and 13, What's the system lifetime? I would take 12, and I take the maximum of these two numbers, which is 13. Okay? It would be 13. <laughs> okay? This one goes 16 years, this one goes 12 years, this one goes 13 years, this system goes 13 years. According to this, the current has passed from one right? Okay? So, that's if I put specific numbers. What's the density of the system lifetime? Multiply the density. I think probably the easiest way to call this one, if I call this time 1, which in the example was 12, and this time 2, time T2, which in the example was 13, then I call them T1 and T2 to get another layer of times, okay? I have, I have the system life times the maximum of these two times. These are still independent times because you have independent sets of components. These are independent. And I need, and let's see, the system life time is that. So what's the, the, if I call this capital T, so what's capital F sub T of T is the probability that the maximum of T1 and T2 less than or equal to little t. Okay. How do you deal with that probability? This is CDF. Calculate the CDF of the system lifetime first. And then take the derivative to find the density of the system lifetime. That's the basic method. 
How do I deal with this probability? The the maximum is less equal to t. So everything is less than t. So you try yeah. to get um, t one first. Like okay, you could. I just uh, I was going to work from the outside in kind of thing. First, I'm putting layering these things. I realize I want to simplify, so I'm putting more notation, and this is what I want in the end. And it turns out that the reason I'm doing this is that um, I'm going to basically take each arm of a parallel system. Call those the times, and then write this because this is easy to write out. This is easy to write out. How? Why? Uh, she was just saying why. Because the maximum is less than t if only if both are less than t. Okay, here with this example, now this kind of falls down because I'm thinking all of these. You have to think of random. You have to think of, of well, you have to think of random triples, right? So 16, 12, 13 here. But the next one is 17, 18. Nine, blah blah blah. So, what percentage of the random triples, okay, is it that both t1 and t2 are less than or equal to t? Uh, the, the maximum is less than or equal to t, okay? It would be that both of them are less than or equal to t. All right. I have, I have calculated the, the minimum here, okay, like the 12, and I have calculated the other one, which is 13. But what percentage of all the triples was it? You understand? I'm just putting a bunch of triples down. What percentage of all the triples was it that both this minimum and this other one were less than equal to t? That means both of them had to be less than equal to t. Exactly. Both of them were less than equal to t. This is the product. The maximum is less than equal to t if only of each individual one is less than equal to t. That's the, that's the basic expression. <coughs> Then this would have figured in, okay, because they were both less than 14. If t was 12 and a half, this triple would not have figured in to the ones that did satisfy this inequality. Right? Because this one was less than 12 and a half, but that one was not less than this, this t1 was not less than 12 and a half. The maximum is less than 12 and a half. Triples actually came into the event. The maximum is times less than equal to t. It's exactly the triples that come into this other way of describing it. Okay, both conditions have to be satisfied. As long as both conditions were satisfied, the triple came in. All right. All right. That's the basic trick. Now, and so this is f sub one of t times s sub two. Everybody happy with that? That's the parallel system. Now I'm going to work backwards and figure out what these two things are. So f, where s one is a distribution function of capital T1, f sub 2 is a distribution function. Is that a 1 minus f? No, these are this, just a CDF method. All I'm doing here is a CDF method. That's why you lost the point, because, <laughs> I'm sorry. You did a very good paper, but you, you, there was a little confusion. Okay, at one point. So T1 is less than T. Probability yeah. of T. Yeah, that's just the cumulative distribution function of capital. I thought cumulative. Cumulative distribution function is just the probability of this event. Oh, yeah. <coughs> okay. All right. So here's what I'm trying to say. You have to just work in the parallel lines first, then go in. Figure out what these other to figure out what the F1 and F2 are. Alright, so what is F1? F1 of T is the hard one. Okay? That's the probability that now that the minimum 
of C1 and C2 is less than or equal to T. Okay. Now there's a way to deal with this. How do you deal with the minimum less, less than or equal to T? One minus complement. Figure it. Yeah, you go to the complement. So this is the probability that the minimum of C1 and C2 is, is 1 minus probably this is bigger than T. Now, and just kind of similar to what we were talking before, the minimum now is bigger than a number. The minimum is now I'm looking at, I can think of only a pairs now, but I'm looking at these two components. I'm change my probability space, okay? So I can think of only these pairs, 16 and 12. The minimum is bigger than 12 and a half. It's only a, both of them are bigger than So this is 1 minus uh, the probability that C1 is bigger than T times the probability that C2 is bigger than T. Okay. So 1 minus. Now, what is, what is the survival probability of an exponential? Well, now we're going to start computing some of these probabilities. When I get down to the C's, I can do the calculation. The survival probability is e to the minus lambda t. Right. The survival probability is e to the minus lambda t. There's three things we've talked about. The density, lambda e to the minus lambda t. The survival probability is e to the minus lambda t. And the CDN, which is 1 minus e to the minus lambda t. Okay. So you get 1 minus e to the minus 2 lambda t, which gives you the little result here, which you may also memorize, is that it is the minimum of two exponentials of rate lambda, independent, it is an exponential of rate 2 lambda. Because this is the CDF of an exponential with rate 2 lambda. We're talking about having class about flipping coins. And that's the kind of thing flipping coins at a very fast rate. With a very small probability of hits. <laughs> okay. All right. Flipping twice as many coins, probably. You've got it. This one's flipping coins, you tell when it's going to die. This one's flipping coins, tell when it's going to die. Together, they're flipping you know, twice as many coins as you would think for a single one. That one and the other one was is, is just the CDF of an exponential of rate one of rate lambda, so it's one minus e to the minus lambda t. Okay, so now I put them together. That's f one of t times f two of t equals one minus e to the two lambda t times one minus e to the lambda t, and that's the CDF of the system lifetime. Then you just multiply this out and differentiate to get the density. This is 1 minus e to the minus 2 lambda t, minus e to the minus lambda t, plus e to the minus 3 lambda t. Okay? And then the rest is to take the density. The density of the system by the time, then, of course, is the derivative of the CDF equals 0 plus 2 lambda e to the minus plus lambda e to the minus lambda t minus 3 lambda e to the minus t. Keep that in the term. Okay. Now you're experts. This problem. Let's get to the last problem before the extra credit problem. Okay. Okay, let's talk about a geometric random variable. What I would like you to do, know for a geometric random variable is, is what's the definition of a geometric random variable? Let's say in terms of Bernoulli trials, independent Bernoulli trials, what's the definition? The amount of time to take until it's successful. Right. The amount of time until for success. Independent Bernoulli trials. For success. For success. Good. So how would you do for part A of this problem? Let x be a geometric random variable with probability p of success in this definition. So here, implicitly I'm asking for the definition, as it turns out. Or, you know, you could get by without it, but certainly you're going to need to know the density. 
So the probability that x equals to this to, well, maybe you don't actually need to know the load density. Probably, they actually don't need to know the density, but let's say a probability mass function, but I can write it down anyway. Uh, p, 1 minus p to the k minus 1, k is 1, 2, and so on. You might want to know it, it depending on how you do the problem. Now I'm asking, what's the probability that's bigger than k? If you use a, use a density, you've got to sum a geometric series, right? Mm -hmm. be the same j goes from k plus 1 to infinity p 1 minus p j minus 1. Okay? Just use a, just use a substitution index. You know, like a substitution variable. So I can do that and calculate the geometric series. That would be one way. But another way to do it is, is to use, you know, I saw at least one person did this right. The event x is bigger than k is the event that the first k trials are failures, right? It's exactly that. So rewriting the event x bigger than k. It's exactly that. So then this, so then the probability is then the probability x bigger than k, therefore it's just the probability that the first k trial will tell you. What's that? Well, I guess we might be okay. Oh, that's wrong. <laughs> I did it wrong I did it longer than that. So actually this is the proof. I mean, this is how you can sum this geometric series, right? So you can sum this geometric series just like that. Yeah. That's kind of... So if I do that for if I do that for um, k equals to zero, it shows that it's the density. Okay, it shows that it is a probability mass function. Okay, I get one. And um, so anyway, it's, it's just it's a curiosity that you can actually sum a geometric series. It's not very hard to sum a geometric series anyway, but I can sum it this way. All right. Okay. Then part B. What's, part B is not that difficult, right? Part B is show that the probability x. How do I do the probability that x is bigger than k plus l? This is the memorialist property, the geometric distribution. There are two memorialist distributions: one continuous, and one discrete. You have the exponential, and you have the geometric. They really are analogous. Okay. How would you calculate such a probability? You would say that's the probability. That how do you do PA given B? PA given B is PA intersect B divided by PB. That's the definition of conditional probability. Now, so that's, so now what is A? A is the event that X is bigger than K plus L. And here, this is B, the event that X is bigger than K. Uh, Yeah. 
This is a smaller event. A is contained in B. A implies B. If A holds, then certainly B holds. Okay? Sorry that I had a little typo here. No, it's okay. I did it right on the paper. Now, okay? So that means the intersection is just A. Yeah. So this is PA divided by PB in this case. So it's here. A is a subset of B. Okay? I'm taking you through the whole deal here. Trying to get you to understand this test. If you do at this point, you should do well. Now, so this is uh, the probability that x is bigger than k plus l divided by the probability that x is bigger than l. Which, by part a, is simply 1 minus p to the k plus l divided by 1 minus p to the l. L's cancel and you get 1 minus p to the k, which is the probability that x is bigger than k. The member of the property. Because it didn't, you know, you remember you've been flipping coins. Okay. So, all right. Given that you've survived a time L, what's the chance that you survive a time K plus L? Assuming that X is the death time of some kind of discrete death process. Okay? Wait for your number to come up. Okay? <laughs> Okay. So what's it say? Is in, it's independent of L? Yeah, this probability is independent of L. Okay. Very good. So that's the memorable property. That's the condition property. Probability is independent of L. credit problem. People were having a little bit of trouble. I, we're out of time now, but what 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 was the Find deal with that? Limits. Do you do Find the limits. Or well the thing is that here's okay, a couple of mistakes I saw in the homework were um, there's first the formula is this f sub z of z equals integral minus infinity to infinity f of x z minus x dx. This is the formula I need you to use. In general, it's not just the convolution of two marginal densities because it's only that if the if the joint density is a joint density of independent variables. Uh -huh. Okay? Here are the variables are not independent. So this only becomes a convolution integral in that case. But anyway, you can always have this formula and it will fall off with the other one. Alright? The more special case. This, this is the general case. All right, now the real trick is how do you deal with this? Here I gave f of x, y is equal to e to the minus x, zero. I gave you the same triangular support. <laughs> okay, look at that. Okay, and this problem. I probably won't do that a third time. All right, but there it is. Now, what's playing the role of y is the z minus x, but z is fixed. Z is fixed in this calculation. I put this in for y, so that means this is the integral, therefore, for all x such that x has to be positive, 0 less than the y x, and um, well, and y less than, and z minus x less than or equal to x. Okay? Looks like here. Okay. x has to be positive, and y, which is the z minus x, has to be less than I get e to the minus x dx. Okay, so that gives that gives z, that gives x greater than or equal to z over two. Uh, let's see. Do I have this correct? Yeah. So you say zero is less than or equal to z minus x is less than or equal to x. Also, with z minus x, y has to be greater than or equal to zero. Z minus yeah. x is greater than zero. <laughs> So that was the part that I really need. I don't need that x is greater than zero. I need that z minus x is greater than zero. Y has to be greater than zero. So you've got to be careful with these inequalities. These two inequalities have to be brought in. So that means x is less than or equal to z, but greater than or equal to z over 2. So it goes 0 over 2, less than or equal to x, less than or equal to z. That's what I came out with. So you just integrate this from 0 over 2 to z, e to the minus x dx. And you get your answer. Yeah, the limits are the hard part. Yeah. That's all there is to that problem. So extra credit. Take it. Mm -hmm. Alright? So are we
Are we really going to have extra credit on the test? Why not? Yeah. You always have extra credit. I'll put a little extra credit. I might not put that second extra credit, but I probably might not put two extra credit. But anyway, we'll come and have 75 minutes for the test on Thursday. Um, I'll give you notes 10 next time.